This is a mathematics lecture on the Riemann-Roch theorem for the special case of genus zero surfaces. So um, genus zero surfaces are particularly easy and the Riemann-Roch theorem for these is um, very elementary and we can just check it explicitly. So what we're going to do, we're going to verify the Riemann-Roch theorem for a particular Riemann surface, the projective line, and then we'll use the Riemann rock theorem to classify genus zero surfaces and show that they're all isomorphic to, to the projective line, at least over the complex numbers. So the genus zero surface, um, if we're talking about compact surfaces, it means the surface is just a sphere. So um, you can either take the surface to be the projective line if you're an algebraist, or if you're an analyst, you can take it to be the Riemann sphere which is the complex numbers together with a point at infinity. So the general Riemann-Roch theorem says that L of D is degree of D plus one minus G plus L of K minus D, where you just remember that D is a divisor. Uh, the degree is the number of points in the divisor. G is the genus. K is the canonical divisor. And L of a divisor tells you the number of dimension of the space of functions whose poles lie only on the divisor D, roughly speaking. So let's look at the special case of this for genus zero. Well, first of all, the genus is zero, so we can omit that term. Next, we have to evaluate the canonical divisor. So the canonical divisor is just the set of zeros of a one form. So we could take a one form on um, C, and it has no zeros or poles, as you can see. And we need to know what happens at infinity. Well, we can see what happens at infinity by making the change of variables y equals 1 over z, in which case dz becomes minus 1 over y squared dy. And you see this has a pole of order 2 at y equals 0, which corresponds to z being the point at infinity. So the canonical divisor, which is the set of zeros of dz, is minus 2 times the point infinity, because a pole of order 2 counts as a 0 of order minus 2. In particular, we see the degree of k is equal to minus 2, and L of k is equal to 0. There are no um, holomorphic one forms on the surface. So the Riemann-Roch theorem for genus zero uh, now looks like this. It just says L of D is equal to the degree of D plus one plus L of minus D minus two times the point infinity. Here where, where L of D is the dimension of the functions f such that f plus d is greater than or equal to naught. You remember this means the zeros of f, and this essentially just means that all the poles of f have to lie on d. Um, and in fact, this formula here can be written down more explicitly as follows. First of all, if degree of d is less than zero, then L of d equals zero. This is true for any compact Riemann surface, whether or not it is genus zero, because a function can't have more zeros than poles. On the other hand, if the degree of D is greater than or equal to zero, then L of D is the degree of D plus one. And this is because the degree of minus D minus two times infinity is now less than zero, so L of minus D minus two times infinity is equal to zero. So this term up here cancels out. Um, so we have an explicit formula for the number of functions whose zeros are on D that depends only on the degree of D. And we should point out that um, this depends only on degree of d, and this is 
a simplification that occurs only for genus zero Riemann surfaces. As soon as the genus is bigger than zero, then working out this number here becomes rather more complicated. In fact, this is one of the reasons I said that genus zero is just a sort of easy warming up exercise. So what we're going to do is just verify this directly. Um, the point is that suppose we're given a divisor, D is sum of n i p i, and let's take all p i to be um, on the complex plane, and we're not going to take p i to be at infinity for the moment. And now let's find uh, a function on C, let's say it's rational, such that f is equal to D. So we're not worrying about what happens at f at the point infinity, we're just looking at its values on the finite plane. And it's obvious how to do this. We can just take the product of z minus pi to the ni. And this obviously has a zero of order um, n at pi. Um, and what happens at infinity? Well, it has um, the order of the pole at infinity is just sum of all the ni's. So on C union infinity, the zeros of f are just d minus sum of ni times the point infinity. So you see this, this now has degree equal to zero. And conversely, you can see that any degree zero divisor can be written in this form for some um, divisor on C. Um, and now, now it's easy to check that what L of D is. First of all, for any Riemann surface, and if P is a point, then L of D plus P is at most L of D plus one. So it's equal to L of D if there's no function um, in, this, in this space with a pole of maximal possible order at P. And if there is a function in the space with a pole of maximum possible order at p, then, that, that, then it gives you an extra plus one to the space of functions with, with poles on, 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 on this divisor. On the other hand, if, if the function is genus zero and the degree of d is greater than or equal to zero, then L of d plus p is now going to be greater than or equal to L of d plus one, because we can always find a function with the pole of maximal possible order for this divisor, which will not be an L of D. So L of D plus B has to be bigger than L of D. Um, so, so we can find this function just by writing down it explicitly like this. So we find that if the degree of D is at least zero, then L of D is exactly equal to the degree of D plus one. Um, so now that we've worked out uh, L of D in all cases, we can just check the Riemann-Roch theorem explicitly. So I suppose the degree of D is one of these numbers, minus three, minus two, minus one, zero, one, two, three, and so on. Then what is L of D? Well, it's zero, 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 one, two, three, four, and so on. What's L of K minus D? Well, this is degree minus two minus the degree of D. So, so L of this goes like this. It goes, um, it's uh, zero, 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 one, two, three, and so on. So now we can look at what is L of D minus L of K minus D. But it looks like this, it goes um, zero, one, two, three, four, minus one, minus two, minus three, and so on. And you can see that this is just the degree of um, D plus one. And what you should also notice is that this line here is a polynomial, whereas this line here is not a polynomial. And this line here is not a polynomial either. And what's going on here is that more generally, um, L of D turns out to be the dimension of a zeroth cohomology group, and L of K minus D turns out to be the zero, 
to be the dimension of a first cohomology group. And in general, the dimensions of cohomology groups don't vary like polynomials. I mean, it's a polynomial here, but then it changes. On the other hand, if you take the Euler characteristic, which is an alternating sum of dimensions of cohomology groups, that often turns out to be a polynomial. So, so this number here is really a sort of Euler characteristic. And Euler characteristics often behave really nicely and turn out to be polynomials. Um, well, so that verifies the Riemann-Roch theorem, at least in the case of the Riemann sphere. Um, now what we want to do is to classify um, Riemann surfaces with, with genus G equal to zero. So let's write down the Riemann-Roch theorem here. We get L of D is equal to the degree of D plus one minus G, which is zero, um, plus L of K minus D. Now, as before, in a previous lecture, we find that the degree of K is minus two and L of K is zero. Um, and as usual, L of D is equal to zero if the degree of D is less than zero. Um, so the Riemann-Roch theorem becomes L of D is equal to the degree of D plus one if the degree of D is greater than or equal to zero and naught if the degree of D is less than zero. Um, so in particular, um, we see that L of zero is equal to one. In fact, this is always true. The, this is just the space of constants, which is one dimensional. And L of P is equal to two if P is a point. So this is just a divisor consisting of one point. And in particular, you notice that L of P is greater than L of zero. So there is a function Um, F with um, a pole of order one at P and no other poles. Um, so uh, for Riemann surfaces of genus greater than zero, we don't get functions with just a single pole and no other zeros. So this is a sort of characteristic of genus zero Riemann surfaces. Well, um, we can use this function. Um, it's now a function from our Riemann surface or algebraic curve to the complex numbers. And we notice that F is injective um, because F minus C has exactly one zero for any number C in C because it's only got one pole. Um, so we've got an injective function from X to C. This doesn't, uh, sorry, C union infinity. This doesn't actually imply that X is isomorphic to C union infinity because it might, X might have singularities if it's an algebraic curve. However, if X is non-singular, and this easily implies that F is an isomorphism. Um, if you just want to see um, an, an example of an algebraic curve with a singularity such that um, there's an injective map that's not an isomorphism, we can just take the curve y squared equals x cubed, which looks has a sort of cusp like this. And if you take the function F to be y over x, then it's an injective map from this curve um, to the Riemann sphere. You can add a point at infinity if you like, but it's not an isomorphism of algebraic curves because of this singular point here. It's actually a homeomorphism of topological spaces. So it's, it does in some sense have an inverse. However, this inverse um, isn't, a, isn't a regular map of Riemann of algebraic curves. So this shows that any genus zero uh, 
curve, and in non-singular, complete genus zero curve is um, isomorphic to the projective line over the complex numbers. Um, another thing we can do with genus zero curves is um, they're very closely related to unique factorization domains. So genus zero sort of is more or less equivalent to being a unique factorization domain. What we can do is, is we can define a curve y to be, say, p1 minus a finite number of points. And we can let r be the ring of rational functions which are regular on y. For example, if, if we take y to be just c, then r is just the ring of polynomials in one variable over, over the complex numbers. Now the point is that r is a unique factorization domain. Um, and you can see this because the Riemann-Roch theorem implies that for each p in R, we can find a function with a pole at this point P and no other zeros and poles. So we can find a function GP, which is zero at P, no other zeros. And then we, we get unique factorization because any other function um, F on R, um, is just a product over p of gp to the np, where np is the order of the zero of f at p. Uh, I guess this should be times a unit, where u is a unit. So we've got a factorization of f into primes, where the primes are these um, numbers here. Um, so you see unique factorization to primes has this following very strong geometric meaning. It says roughly that given any collection of points and multiplicities, you can find an essentially unique function with, with those zeros or, or, or to a unit or whatever. Um, so um, in, for, for genus greater than zero, it's very unusual for rings like this to be unique factorization domains. I think there are a handful of examples over small finite fields, but uh, usually um, being a unique factorization domain in the case of curves is almost equivalent to um, its completion being genus zero. Um, so genus zero curves are actually really quite different from higher genus curves. Really, you, you, should, you should divide curves into three classes. Genus zero, which we've covered today. Genus one, which I'll be doing a bit later. And genus greater than one. And the differences are, well, here the degree of the canonical divisor is less than zero. Here the degree of the canonical divisor is equal to zero. And here the degree of the canonical divisor is greater than zero. Um, if you do differential geometry, you know these correspond to surfaces with curvature greater than zero. Here the curvature equals zero, and here the curvature is less than zero. Um, um, in fact, in differential geometry, the gauss bonnet theorem says that you can um, relate the genus, or rather the Euler characteristic, to the curvature the Euler characteristic, which is um, 2 minus 2g, is just the integral of the curvature times some fudge factor, which I can't remember. Um, um, there's also something called the Cadera dimension, which is indicated by a uh, Greek letter kappa. Um, the Cadera dimension um, is related to the number of one forms, which in turn is related to the degree of the canonical divisor. So the Cadera dimension is by convention um, given as zero, one, zero, minus infinity, zero or one. And the Kadara dimension really controls the behavior of 
um, curves or more generally algebraic varieties in higher dimensions. Um, genus zero also has many automorphisms. Um, so if you've got the projective line, you know it's acted on by PGL2 of the complex numbers. Uh, genus one also has met quite a lot of automorphisms because this can be written as C over L, which is a group, so this group acts on itself. Here there are a few automorphisms. In fact, the automorphism group of a typical curve of genus greater than one just has one element, and in general it's always finite. Um, genus zero, as we've just seen, tend to be unique factorization domains. Genus one and genus greater than one are usually not unique factorization domains. So you see the genus zero surfaces we've discussed, genus zero Riemann surfaces we've discussed today are really quite unlike the um, curves of higher genus we're going to discuss later on. Okay, the next lecture on this, we'll be talking about uh, the Riemann-Roch theorem in the case of curves of genus one.